Thank you. Um, sorry for the back-to-back -back NIH action. So I want to start with my disclaimers. First of all, most of the work's investigational. Second, I'm an inventor on some patent applications that are assigned to NIH. And finally, we have a research collaboration with uh, one of the MRI vendors. So I'm grateful to be invited, and I think that uh, DOF must have had a typographical error, but more likely it was a Freudian slip in spelling the ti my assigned title Wither MRI catheterization. As you know, people have been saying for a long time that MRI is, uh, is it's the future. It's, it's five years away, and it always will be. <laughs> so I'm here to show you that um, w maybe it's not as much a withering flower. Again, I acknowledge the same wonderful team that uh, Kanishka mentioned. So you know that you can buy in the store an X-ray and an MRI and put them next to each other, um, like this one. Uh, and you can use them together if you wish, or you can use them separately, um, and that can make your hospital administrators happy. You saw that this system is on uh, x-ray rails. Uh, you don't need that anymore. In fact, the vendor won't sell that to you. You can just buy a, a, a gurney to move patients between one modality and the other. Um, once inside the magnet, you can set it up to resemble an interventional suite. You have a screen that shows your stuff, your instantaneous hemodynamics, your real-time images, your scan control, um, we don't wear lead because there's no x-ray radiation, but it's acoustically hostile, so we wear these uh, headsets. Um, but the point I want to make is that at NIH, at least, and now at uh, uh, some other hospitals, MRI is no longer, MRI catheterization for simple hemodynamic studies is no longer investigational. It's just a standard clinical study. So if you come to my hospital and, and uh, your physician asks for a hemodynamic investigation, We'll do as much of it as possible under MRI, and that's not under research protocol. And the ingredients are just a good cardiac MRI tech, a scanner that you buy in the store, some fairly expensive uh, audio headsets, and some LCD projectors, and a jerry-rigged hemodynamic recording system. More on all that. So the setup, as I mentioned, is simple. Um, we just uh, cover our patient with drapes, and we cover our scanner with drapes when we move them from one to the other. Um, we get a bunch of $2,000 LCD projectors and a $50 screen. We make sure that our table is a little sparse and it has only MRI safe components. And this is a view of our scanner from the door. It's a, it's a one and a half uh, Tesla scanner, so it's relatively inexpensive and it's only a little more than a, than a meter long. Okay. So why bother? Um, I like to see what I'm doing. I know most of the talented pediatric cardiologists in this room are able to work largely with your eyes closed, and that's because that's the best x-ray has been able to afford you. But perhaps more important is if you're making an important clinical decision based on flow, I think it would be nice to have an accurate measure of flow. And a lot of the measures that um, the entire field's been relying on for years may not be entirely accurate and re reproducible. Of course, avoidance of radiation is desirable, but maybe it's not the highest priority. But what would be really nice is to exploit the versatility of imaging that MRI affords. If you want to know, is this tissue dead? Is this tissue alive? It, it, what is the flow across this artery? You can measure that in a clinically acceptable workflow. And another point I make is you may have witnessed your adult colleagues transition from femoral artery catheterization, which is really easy, to radial artery catheterization that's a little more entertaining. And that was kind of a discipline transition to get good at it. And for us, we already went through that discipline transition from X-ray and MRI, and I hope perhaps someday soon some of you will undergo that. I, I don't need to explain to a pediatric audience how to measure flow, but you know that thermal dilution measures are intrinsically inaccurate, especially in the setting of tricuspid regurgitation, which is important for our patients, or in low cardiac output because of heat loss. You know also that FIC flow measurements are intrinsically inaccurate. They make assumptions about the distribution of cardiac uh, perfusion. You know that um, the SNR can be markedly reduced when you require supplemental oxygen, and um, these estimates don't hold off during physiologic stress. By comparison, MRI flow is reproducibly less than about 10 percent. I think that's one of the key strengths for uh, this audience. So I'm going to show you our first MRI catheterization in a patient. This was a few years ago. Um, it's really easy. We take a balloon catheter. I'm sorry for the PowerPoint problem. We take a balloon wedge and hole catheter, and we fill the balloon with dilute gadolinium. 
And then I know you can't see the shaft of the catheter, but you know, that's what makes it fun. You can spin into any simple chamber. You see us getting to the superior vena cava. You see us um, getting from the right ventricle into the main pulmonary artery. You see how the lights sometimes go on and off? That's us. We're turning on um, a certain imaging mode in MRI that makes just the gadolinium show up bright and the rest of the blood pool show up dark. You see us selecting one or the other pulmonary artery. Isn't it refreshing to be able to see the, the uh, artery you're working on while you're spinning your catheter? This is just another study. Um, it's the same general idea. You saw us spinning up into the uh, SVC. You see two simultaneous slices. That's how we usually work. We can interactively change the temporal resolution. You saw us get into the pulmonary artery and now selecting one or the other. Pay attention to the time stamp. It started around 10 o'clock. And so now we're messing around, make, measuring wedge pressure in one or the other. Now it's about 1018, and that's because um, we've given nitric oxide. And then now it's 1028. We uh, we then gave uh, uh, another stress. I think it was saline. So in in less than an hour, we're able to measure uh, pressure, flow, and function three times. That's that's not bad, and uh, I think probably most of you could do better if you just started. So this is a table that I like to show. It's like when you buy um, um, uh, catheterization uh, free edition or catheterization deluxe edition. With, with uh, catheterization alone, you don't get all these big positive symbols. With catheterization plus MRI, all, everything in this column is really extra special good. I'll just point out some things. If you want to measure regurgitant fraction, you can actually measure it on the table in less than a minute, for real. If you want to measure viability, is that target worth revascularizing? You can see it. Look in the upper right-hand corner. I like this one. If, if you have 30 seconds to spare, you can give a half cc of gadolinium contrast and just do a quick perfusion study. On the left, that's normal. This patient doesn't have CTEP. The same study, 30 seconds. I'm really not exaggerating. This patient has manifest chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. We don't need no stinking VQ scan because you can do it on the magnet. If there's an anomalous pulmonary vein, is it nice to see it? And on and on and on. I know I sound like a used car salesman, and to, to, uh, to a certain extent I am, but I just want to show you that you could start doing this today. So where are we headed? First of all, it's been useful in our lab because having the ability to look at tissue while we instrument it has inspired a whole bunch of procedures, some of which in, in varying stages of clinical translation. Toby Rogers developed a tricuspid annuloplasty. Um, we've developed this transcaval approach for TAVR, which has now been introduced to almost 100 patients. And uh, 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 tricuspid, uh, excuse me, uh, mitral cerclage annuloplasty is about to be tested in patients too. This has all been inspired by the kind of technology that Kanishka showed you and that I'm showing you now. So the main reason we can't do anything beyond, especially beyond uh, simple diagnostic studies is that there are not too many MRI-safe uh, uh, catheter tools that are suitable for humans. We've been working now for years to make an electronic antenna that um, serves also as a guide wire. You see how nice and bright it is, and you can see the tip. It's nice and discreet. Um, it turns out we have the MR safety, and we have the uh, mechanical properties just fine, but we've been struggling with making a safe hydrophilic coating be, uh, as is uh, much of the industry. So uh, that project's been a little stalled, but I hope to make progress soon. In the meantime, I'm kicking myself because we found a simple way to make uh, a guide wire that, is, that resembles kind of a glide wire, maybe as a, a poor man's glide wire, except a poor man who has a lot of money, um, a guide wire that's, um, that's safe under MRI. You, you may not know this, but any all the catheter devices we use are, are full of metal that, that conducts. And, and like when you put metal in a microwave, it's going to heat up. If it turns out that the metal segments are nice and short, they're not going to heat up. So stupid me, it took me m almost 10 years to figure this out. If you just take a bunch of metal sticks, coat them with plastic so they don't conduct, and stick them one on top of the other, you can have a guide wire that is not going to heat up. And in, in animals, it really works. And you can see it coils up beautifully. So sometime, I hope pretty soon, we'll be able to introduce this in patients. And I promise you, if you enter the field of MRI catheterization, we'll give them to you. Um, this is something Kanishka gave a little teaser for before. Um, he mentioned doing um, um, perventricular uh, uh, muscular VSD repair under MRI, and that's cute, except he forgot to mention that the chest is closed. Why on earth should you have to open the chest to close a hole in the heart um, when you can see the defect and you know where to stick your tools. And so those are Kanishka's fingers. 
and this is uh, an off-the-shelf Amplets or muscular VSC occluder. The only modification is to make it really groovy and green is we, uh, we modify the cable a little bit to turn it into a, an electronic antenna. And um, I, th I think that's really intriguing. I think you could do a lot with this. Um, he also closed the free wall of the right ventricle. Um, at first he filled the pericardium intentionally with a little bit of fluid to separate the uh, walls of the pericardium and then he closed it with another device, in this case a uh, collagen plug. I thought that was cute. Um, this is another project Kanishka hinted on. I, I love this because I think this is the kind of project that may be hard reliably and safely to do under MRI. I don't doubt that you can connect two chambers under x-ray, but I do doubt that you'll know necessarily that you're in trouble unless you have imminent hemodynamic collapse. So under MRI, Kanishka performed a Glenn shunt in, in, only in pigs. It hasn't been done in patients yet. He has an MRI needle. He's sticking from the SVC into the main pulmonary artery. He uh, avoided this, this structure. This, isn't this an important structure, this one that has high pressure blood? He avoided that. Um, you know, we didn't have great tools, so he used two tandem uh, covered uh, cheetah platinum stents. And so it, it, it took a little time to do. But it's really cute because he's got great stable purchase. He's occluded the azagus. And, uh, and he has a bidirectional cable pulmonary shunt. So um, we realized the limitations of the off-the-shelf device, so we asked uh, our friend Nasser Rafi at Mayor Medical to make a purpose-built device, and I think this is really nice. And now the procedure, I'm amazed. I can't even get off, get off the phone and get, on, get off of my email when uh, Kanishka's punctured and delivered this device in about 15 minutes. It's really nice, and, 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 and this is not magic. It's not that, that this is a great gift. It's just that, that we have great gifts. It's that we have a great imaging tool. And, and I think if you were equipped with better imaging tools, you could do a better job in your, in your daily life. Here's a project we've been working on for a long time. It's about eight years of failure. You know, the, the $15 uh, uh, disposable stainless steel biotome you buy in the store and use often is great because stainless steel is great and cheap and effective. But if you replace it with a metal that's not going to destroy the MRI image, um, it's very hard to get a, a cutter that's, that's sharp. So Perry Karmakar finally found a cutter that's nice and sharp. And you can, isn't it cute that we can steer our biotome, see the tissue, and get realistic specimens? That's just a prototype, and I, I uh, stay tuned. I hope that uh, we'll have a clinical device in a reasonable period. And then Kanishka gave another teaser for this project that I personally love. Um, the idea is to obtain coaxial access to the mitral valve in patients who have sick hearts and whom um, transapical access, in my view, is unattractive. What he didn't mention is it's, it's, a, it's a simple straight shot through the right chest into the center line of the apex to mitral annulus to left atrium. But there's one problem, the lung's in the way. And um, uh, stupid me, our surgical colleagues for years um, either shove the lung away or we shove the lung away with a little carbon dioxide. The procedure had to be done prone, and the carbon dioxide rises to the top of the chest. But what's really great about MRI is that you can see the lung get deflated. And then when the, once the lung's deflated, this is actually a lot easier to do under MRI than under x-ray. Once the lung's inflated, you can stick a needle in and exchange for a sheath. And now we have straight line sheath access to the mitral. You know, in pigs and in sheep, it's not really that straight. But in human simulations and in human cadavers, we've tested it, and it works pretty well. And then Kanishka showed you earlier that it's very simple to close with an off-the-shelf amplet septal occluder, which, to my amazement, um, even in, uh, in slightly elevated left atrial pressure, is immediately hemostatic. We've been getting away with a lot with these off-the-shelf devices. Um, I, I'm showing this slide because I want you to know that NHLBI is really interested in helping um, cultivate the development of new important devices for your important field of pediatric interventional cardiology. It may be hard to make a business case um, to justify the large initial outlay, outlay in prototyping and, and uh, clinical testing of devices, especially in the United States. But we're able, and please contact us, we're able to specify topics for the Institute to make money available as set-asides for important topics of interest to you. This is just a sample. And imagine the things that uh, we create if we had your ideas. So if you want to get started into MRI catheterization, we will help you. First of all, in November, we've tentatively scheduled a uh, hands-on workshop. We've offered this to uh, one team that's in the room and uh, another that's not here. So we're getting a, a little practice on how to teach people. We'll, we'll show you how to make a setup, 
we'll show you how to instrument in an animal, and uh, maybe we'll have a patient. Also, next February, we're going to have a workshop. And uh, if you're interested, we invite you to join us and learn more about how to get started. So now that I've learned how to spell the word wither, wither MRI catheterization, I think, you know, the progress has been disappointingly slow, but I think we've shown it's feasible. For certain measurements where uh, flow uh, accuracy is important, I think MRI is attractive, not to mention avoidance of radiation. But what's really groovy is what's, is what's down the pike once we have additional um, MRI safe instruments. So I thank you very much for your attention, and that's that. We're running a bit behind, so we have time for a question, if anybody wants to pose one. Evan. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, and I, I have one quick question. So. In terms of getting catheters through the heart, uh, you know, watching the balloon tip catheter, you can see the balloon great, but, and I'm sure that works great in sort of normal anatomy, but obviously most of the patients, you know, we catheterize, sometimes moving those catheters through the right heart is the hardest part of the day, and, and uh, it's hard for me to envision doing a, a lot of cases without being able to see the catheter shaft. We, we do so many things with that, right? We, we make loops, and we put tension, and we torque, and it's not as easy as just seeing the balloon. So is there something on the forefront um, where we'll be able to actually see the body of the catheter? Yes, and that answer is when we have that segmented guide wire. It has little dots of iron. It's cheap, it's simple, and it's intrinsically safe. So I, I hope to have that. If you were to buy a system now, I bet you we'd have that in your hands the same time your system arrives. All you need is a few million dollars. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. That concludes this uh, session, and it looks like we move uh, directly on to the I Blew It session at uh, 3 p.m. <laughs>